Good evening, everyone. My name is Fiona McPherson, and I will be hosting this evening's event. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Open University to this, our fourth work maze webinar on networking. We've allowed 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for question and answer session where you'll have the opportunity to ask questions by using the Q&A panel, which you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is select host from the Ask drop-down menu, type in your question and click on send, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end. You can also provide feedback by using the hand and feedback icons at the bottom of the participant panel as well. Um, at the end of this evening's webinar, we have a feedback form um, which we really appreciate you completing. Um, and also, you'll be taken to the events page where you can sign up for our forthcoming webinars as well. I'd now like to introduce you to our presenter, Lizzie Bird. Lizzie's been working in recruitment for the past 13 years, during which time, amongst other roles, she's been the MBA recruitment manager at Arthur D. Little in the UK and shall be oil and gas multinational. At the moment, Lizzie works as an associate to work maze and continues to work in recruitment-related activities for a number of clients, both in training line managers in how to interview effectively and managing the end-to-end -end recruitment cycle for a number of SMEs. So I'm just going to hand over to Lizzie and I hope you all enjoy the event and we look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much indeed for that, Fiona. Uh, I very much appreciate the introduction. Can I just ask on a very practical level, however, I can't see the notes that I've got, so I do apologise to everybody. Fiona, that just bears me a second. <laughs> Thank you very much. There you go. Sorry, I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, but thank you very much for that introduction, Fiona. No problem. Uh, and welcome to this evening's session on networking. So, yes, I'm Lizzie Bird, and I shall be facilitating the session. My aim is to run through with the presentation for between 40 to 45 minutes, and then, as Fiona mentioned, hand over to you for any questions which you may have on the subject of networking. So to start with, it's probably worth exploring the question, why network? Now, I've done some research to find out the statistics on how many jobs are found through networking alone. And whilst the numbers vary, the consensus does seem to be that it's between 65 to 80 percent of jobs which are unadvertised, either directly or through agencies, and which are found through networking. So that in itself should provide enough impetus to start networking if you haven't already done so. So if even 65% of jobs are unadvertised, then surely 65% of your job search time should be spent networking. But from experience of running various workshops for networking over the last few years, I am very aware that this is a subject matter which has the ability to polarise people, those who love it and those who absolutely hate it. So those lovers of networking view it as a fundamental tool to not only finding a job, but also business success in the longer term. Those who hate networking often see it as crass, insincere, manipulative, and extremely uncomfortable. So my aim through this session is to reduce the cynicism of those of you who find it distasteful, and to provide you with some ideas on how you can start networking in a productive, and yet comfortable and authentic way. For those of you who are already comfortable with networking as a concept, I'd like to encourage you to consider different approaches to the subject and to provide some ideas on how to manage your networking style to be more effective. Okay, so we'll go through this process. So let's start by looking at what networking is. A couple of definitions here. Good networking is making the most of the people you meet to your mutual advantage. From Carol Stone. And Carol Stone is an author and freelance radio and television broadcaster with more than 40,000 names in her electronic address book. She's often been called London's networking queen. Then we have Stephen D'Souza. Networking is the art of building reciprocal relationships that help individuals and the community as a whole to achieve their goals. And Stephen D'Souza is author of the book Brilliant Networking. But the message of both of these definitions is that networking is not a selfish and self-centered act, 
and I'd really like us to take that concept with us as we explore the world of networking. So I'd like to begin by looking at some different styles. One of the greatest challenges that I often hear to the concept of networking is that it's unsavory, grabbing and disingenuous. Now Devorah Zak, in her book, Networking for People Who Hate Networking, a field guide for the introverts, the overwhelmed and the underconnected, suggests that most networking books are written for and most advice is aimed at the minority of the population who are true extroverts. She suggests that this group accounts for about 30% of the population, with 30% being true introverts and the remaining 40% being what she calls centroverts. So this is based on the Myers-Briggs type indicator of the introvert and extrovert definition. I'm sure that many of you will have completed MBTI, but just for clarification, and for those of you who are unaware of MBTI, these specific definitions vary from the popular usage of the words introvert and extrovert. People who prefer extroversion draw energy from action. They tend to act, then reflect, then act further. To rebuild their energy, extroverts need break from time spent just in reflection. Conversely, those who prefer introversion expend energy through action. They prefer to reflect, then act, then reflect again. And to rebuild their energy, introverts need quiet time alone, away from activity. So MBTI suggests a spectrum from extroversion to introver introversion. And Deborah Zack has adapted that to look at the middle ground and has named that group that sit within that area centroverts. So with only 30% of people accounted for in most networking advice, I'd like to spend some time focusing on the other 70%, which may include you if you're uncomfortable with the concept of networking. That said, for the extroverts out there, I'll also cover ideas and suggestions to enhance your networking skills. Okay, so why do extroverts have voicemail? To never miss a call. Why do introverts have voicemail? To never answer the phone. So some of you may well have come across these things before, but I think that they beautifully illustrate the difference between people and their approach to networking. In their extremes, particularly those who are on the other end of the spectrum, extroverts can be seen as show-offs, as a bit smooth in your face, perhaps a bit fake, manipulative, talkative, a little bit schmoozy, a bit clueless, poor listeners, loud mouths, excessive, attention-grabbing, selfish individuals. Conversely, introverts can often be seen as insecure, detached, unfriendly, secretive, aloof, uninteresting, self-engrossed, sedentary, and a little bit dull. Now, for me, these characteristics particularly come out during contrived networking situations. However, I strongly believe that in recognizing who you are and how to work within your style, you are far more likely to have a more positive networking outcome. Okay, so there are some contrasting characteristics between extroverts and introverts, and extroverts seek breadth of knowledge and influence, while introverts seek depth of knowledge and influence. Extroverts often prefer more frequent interaction, while introverts prefer more substantial interaction. Okay, so looking at this slide and building on your strengths is the key to successful and authentic networking. So the introverts out there, it's about being focused, self-reliant, going deep. Extroverts, it's about really being social, being verbal, energizing with others and being expansive in your networking approach. So looking at putting these characteristics into networking strategies, extroverts, your strengths are around speaking, activity and communicating in groups. Introverts. Your strengths are about listening, calmness, and one-to-one -one relationships. So I really want to encourage you to consider where you sit within the spectrum and then to develop your networking approach according to your strengths. The benefits of extroverts are that you engage so easily in conversation and are at ease with diversity and a wide range of people that don't tend to take things personally. However, do watch out for a bit of a tendency to ramble or to provide unnecessarily detailed conversation. 
So give too much of yourself away about your private information and also make sure that you close the loop with conversations and follow up when a commitment has been made. The benefit of introverts is that you have a really strong sense of observation and are attuned to the nonverbals, that you very much think for yourself and that you tend to focus on the internal over the external. However, do be aware that extroverts may perceive relationships with you as one way, with your heightened need for privacy because you don't give much away, that networking really does require adapting to conversations and interruptions, which is not so comfortable for you, and that you also need to look after yourself, since banter and small talk can wipe out energy reserves that you do have. Okay, so having explored different styles, I'd now like to look a little bit more closely at the networking process, starting with some goals. So I'd like to suggest that networking without a goal is a little bit like getting into a car, starting the engine, and realizing that you've no idea where you're going. You're highly likely to get nowhere. So when you're attending any networking events or following up with a contact that you've met or been introduced to in any circumstance, I'd like to encourage you to think about having a goal in mind. This goal could take any form, uh, and it certainly doesn't need to be as blunt as just to get a job. Okay. So as Professor Richard Wiseman suggests in his book, 59 Seconds, Think a Little, Change a Lot, the most successful approaches to achieving goals include the following steps. So break goals down into a series of steps or sub-goals. Tell your friends and family about your, your goals. Regularly remind yourself of the benefits that you have for achieving your goal. And treat failure as a temporary setback rather than a reason to give up. The good thing is that you should reward yourself with every sub-goal that you achieve and record and document your progress. So taking those steps into account with regards to networking, the starting point is to really make sure what your goal is and to make your goal positive. So I would suggest you put something along the lines of, I will attend two networking meetings in the next six months, rather than I will stop avoiding networking functions. Take control. Don't allow your goal to require other cha sorry, either changes in other fundamental personalities, acts of nature, or any significant efforts from others. Make sure that you have a context and appropriate size and scope. So make your goals challenging yet achievable. If you don't believe it's possible, you won't put the effort in, and if it's a piece of cake, you won't bother. I've put here also making goals ecological. By that I mean that they're not in conflict with any of the other values or beliefs that you hold. And also make them measurable. What evidence will let you know that you have succeeded? Okay, so many people mess up on this in networking, for example, by saying, I'm going to meet more people, and that's just too vague. Instead, try something like, I will sign up this week for the annual industry conference in July and make travel arrangements by the end of next week. Either you do do that or you don't do that, so that becomes measurable. Okay. So with those ideas in mind, after this webinar, I challenge you to go and put one goal down on paper. And this could take all sorts of different shapes. Okay, so that could be about speaking with representatives from five different management consultancy firms within the next eight weeks to establish whether this is the right industry for you or not. It could be about securing £5,000 worth of funding by the end of September to help with your business venture or possibly following up with somebody you met at the last event you went to and arrange a coffee to find out more about their industry. Okay, so moving on from goals, let's focus now a little bit on branding. Tom Peters, in his book Brand You 50, Reinventing Work, suggests that you, have, sorry, that to be effective employees in the 21st century, you really need to think and act like a consultant or a company. So think about the last company which you worked with. What values did it embody? What was its mission statement? How did it demonstrate rhetoric through action? So it's important during all of networking, you are clear on who you are and what your brand or your unique selling points are, 
so that you can embody these in all that you say and all that you do. So t some types of elements that you might want to consider are integrity, efficiency, trust, perhaps some technical expertise that you bring, your customer focus. They could come from a series of skills or values that you hold. And if you claim to have these but fail to follow up with correspondence, you're indiscreet with one contact about another contact, uh, you're really tarnishing and devaluing your brand. Again, when we finish this webinar, think about your brand and write down five words which you would like to describe you and which you'd like other people describe you when you're out of the room. Then spend some time preparing an elevator pitch. So when you meet somebody at a networking event, what will be your introduction when somebody invites you to introduce yourself? What are the key messages that you want to bring out? Once you've explored your goals and your branding, take a look at some opportunities for networking. Okay, so I'd like to explore some different channels for networking, but before we go any further, I've just got a couple of thoughts about how and where you keep information about your contacts. One of the challenges of networking, especially when you're in the research phase of your job search, is to keep an accurate account of your networks and contacts that you've made, and just as importantly, of the follow-up actions that you've promised to take. So some tools that you might like to, uh, to look at include Outlook. So using Microsoft Outlook as a business contact management system, um, particularly if you look at the upgrades, that there are some quite uh, useful systems that you can have with Outlook. Uh, perhaps a little bit more old-fashioned is the Rolodex to capture the hard copies of business cards that you collect when you're networking. There are other contact management tools and a number of ones that you can access online, many of which are free. A couple include Zoho and Doorbell. But I'd suggest that you put your contact management software into a search engine and explore the options for one which would suit you most. Personally, I use Microsoft Outlook, uh, as it's also got the business contact management system. I use a combination of Outlook and spreadsheets, particularly for specific networking projects when I'm doing research into a particular area, which again is something that you might want to do, particularly with a job search. And for consideration, your contacts may need to be accessible to you when you're out and about. So again, think about that when you're looking at the best system for you. If you are developing a database or a spreadsheet, you might also want to consider the following. Apart from name and where and where you met them and the company, also include information that you've gathered about their children or their partners, their interests, how you know they prefer communication, whether it's telephone or email, and certainly what you've committed to them and by when you've committed to that action. But I promised we'd talk about some, some opportunities. So we're going to come back to talk about social, me social media very shortly, but before we do so, I want to discuss the networking clubs. Networking clubs are official gatherings whose sole purpose is to encourage and to support networking. There are a number in the UK, um, probably the best known is BMI, BNI, sorry, which runs many different events. There are also many clubs, specifically for any women listening, which include, for example, Sister Snog, Her Business, the Athena Network, and the Women's Business Clubs. Now, typically, these clubs operate by membership. So, in other words, you have to pay a fee up front. And, for example, with BNI, fees are around £650 per year, certainly in the London area. You then attend meetings periodically, during which one person is invited to give a five-minute talk about their service and product, uh, and others are also invited to give talks a little bit shorter. Uh, and you wonder where that elevator pitch comes in. If you're get enrolling in a, in a networking club, then that's certainly an opportunity for that. But the aim is to make useful connections which will lead to new business and job opportunities. Other types of clubs that you might want to look at include perhaps Rotary or eCademy, which is an online club, and also perhaps Toastmasters International. So Tom Peters, who I mentioned earlier, is certainly an alumnus of Toastmasters. When you're planning your networking strategy, 
you want to make sure that you're coming into contact with people who will be of interest to you. So consider industry associations and conferences. If you want to find out about a particular industry, go to their conference. You'll be surrounded by potentially useful contacts. Follow up with alumni. Someone who's been through a similar experience to you is very likely to want to help out and to offer advice and information. And don't dismiss your network of family and friends. Whilst they themselves may not directly know the area that you're interested in researching, it is highly likely that they will know somebody who does. Okay, which leads me neatly into the six degrees of separation. Okay, the six degrees of separation is the theory that anyone can be connected to any other person on the planet through a chain of acquaintances that has no more than five intermediaries. It was first proposed in 1929 by a Hungarian writer, Kerinci, in a short essay called Change. Now, in 1967, an American sociologist, Stanley Milgram, devised a way to test this theory involving sending some packages within the United States. And through this, he discovered that it took on average between five and seven intermediaries for packages to reach recipients and he published an article in Psychology Today called Six Degrees of Separation, which is where we get the name. Now, this was later discounted because it was such a small number of packages and such a small study. However, in 2001, Duncan Watts, who was a professor at Columbia University, continued this research into the phenomenon and used an Internet-based approach instead of sending packages. Having reviewed the data, collected of 48,000 senders and 19 targets, which were spread in 157 countries, he found that the average number of intermediaries was indeed six. So, to bring this in life, I have an exercise for you to do. Okay, I would like you to imagine that you have written a report that will be life-changing for its intended recipient, Brad Pitt but you need to make sure that he sees it. This means not just putting it into the post to him and hoping that he gets it, but using your network to ensure that it is hand-delivered with an appropriate message. Okay, now I'd like to give you one minute to identify a way using your own personal network to get that report to Brad Pitt. Okay, so I'm going to time this, and I'm going to count every 15 seconds until we get to a minute. And I'd like to encourage you to think about your network, personal network, your working networks, any way that you could get to Brad Pitt. And I'm going to start that minute now. That's 15 seconds. Thirty seconds. Forty five seconds. Okay, that's a minute. So I believe that you've got some uh, hands that you can put up on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Please, could you put up your hand? If through your connections you believe that you would be able somehow to get to Brad Pitt. If I could some hands up now, please. Okay, they're coming. Wonderful. All right, so having looked at that, 
at least a quarter of you have been able to get to Brad Pitt somehow through your connections. Um, so that would make us one closer. Fantastic. And from experience of doing this exercise in the past, people have shown very different ways to reach Brad Pitt. So perhaps through contacts that they've got in the film industry, uh, contacts that they have with his ex-girlfriends even, or contacts uh, with Doctors Without Borders, various different routes that people have taken. Um, but thank you very much indeed for doing that exercise. Uh, a couple of reasons for doing that. Firstly, if you can get to Brad Pitt, then you can surely get to a partner with one of the firms that's your target company firm. Um, but also, I'd really like to suggest that through this exercise, uh, we can explore the idea, sorry, the idea of connectors and super connectors. So a super connector is somebody who has a large and diverse network and whose advantage lies in the brokerage of information between different groups that would otherwise not communicate. So super connectors tend to exist either because of their nature or because of their position that they have. And I'd encourage you to really think about your network and identify within your network who are the super connectors. Make sure that you really proactively manage those relationships because the chances are there's a small number of people within your network who are super connectors and who have the power to get you to a large, broader group of individuals. Okay, so you've now looked at your goals and you have a purpose for networking. You're clear on your brand and what you have to offer, and you've identified some channels to reach people. I'd now like to encourage you to take action, which is the most important step of all. So I promised that we'd talk about uh, social media earlier. And introverts and extroverts are likely to feel very differently about social media, particularly on the privacy issue. If you're not sure if you're an introvert or an extrovert, I'd encourage you to consider Facebook. Are you proud of the high number of acquaintances that you have? Do you update your, up your status regularly? How are your privacy settings adjusted? Do you even have Facebook? So on the subject of Facebook, just a couple of comments. It's not a professional networking. Uh, and it's important to make this distinction. If you are tagged in a photo on Facebook, you lose control of who can see what. So particularly if you're an introvert, um, you want to learn to untag yourself. But just be aware that companies are increasingly looking at social media and at Facebook uh, when they're assessing people. So just be aware of how you can manage that. Sharing information is key to networking, and one of the greatest revolutions in recent years is the use of online opportunities and access to virtual communities. But you must manage carefully the information which is out there about you on the internet. You want to get your name known for your expertise in an area or your thoughts around a particular development. And blogs are one way to do this. These can be an important tool in your marketing arsenal, and blogs are used by individuals as online diaries or a place to air views on any subject that you can think of. You can follow people, you can post comments, you can put a link to your URL uh, and start to create a name for yourself in this area. If you are going to have a blog to get known, I'd really encourage you to update it regularly. So wikis allow groups total access to a site to review, change and add information. They can be a great medium for networking as members from all over the country can access the site and add the latest information to keep other members updated. You can display links on your, to your own site to grow your own network. So some very popular wikis are Wikipedia, probably the best known. There's wiki.org and wikihow.com. So you might want to start looking at those wikis. Forums, like chat rooms, where you can go to share your opinions and ideas. Whereas the blog is somewhere you display your ideas and opinions, a forum is where you go to exchange them with other people. So forums can exist either on a site for their own or as part of another website. For example, the Warrior Forum specializes in wealth creation and personal development. Commenting regularly on forums and leaving your link will find yourself being picked up by search engines and will improve your rankings. Okay, and then we've got LinkedIn, and I'm going to touch on this very briefly in the next slide, but I just want to highlight that there will be a webinar held on how to effectively use LinkedIn on the 29th of May. 
Just before we move on to LinkedIn, I did once want to mention a website called netmanners.com, which really talks about the netiquette and the do's and don'ts of working through social media. So that's netmanners.com, which might be worth you having a look at. So LinkedIn, what is it? It's an excellent global networking tool which has over 150 million members in over 200 countries. And a new member joins LinkedIn approximately every second, and over half of the members being outside of the US. It has many, many benefits to it, a few of which are managing the information that's publicly available about your professional background. Okay, you can find and be introduced to potential clients service providers and subject matter experts who come recommended. You can gain new insights from discussions with like-minded professionals in private group settings. There's some great forums to be used on LinkedIn. You can discuss a, sorry, discover inside connections that can help you to land jobs and close deals. And you can post and distribute job listings to find the best talent for your company if you happen to be a recruiter. So, to put the recruitment piece into perspective, According to Computer Weekly of June 2010, Accenture planned to recruit 50,000 people that year with 40% sourced through social media sites alone. So a couple of comments on what LinkedIn is not. It's not a contact management system. It's not a social networking site, and it's certainly not a silver bullet. It is just a tool to facilitate some facets of your networking strategy. Okay, so briefly looking at settings, accounts and setting pages allow you to set up your preferences, and these will determine when you receive emails and when you don't, as well as who can see your list of contacts and what information people can see about you. So this area will be explored further in the LinkedIn webinar in May. Lions are LinkedIn open networkers. So this refers to a person who is interested in having as many connections as they can and indicates a general willingness to accept an invitation from anyone. So the argument for being a lion is that you have a larger number of contacts, the more chance you have of connecting to the person that you want. Many recruiters are open networkers, also salespeople and entrepreneurs, so it's very beneficial to them. You can invite all of your Outlook connections to join you on LinkedIn, but I do warn you there's a limit of 3,000 connections, but you can call customer service and ask for more. Closed networking really is about those people who only want to connect to people that they know and trust. So instead of accepting every single connection request, closed networkers will evaluate the relationship with the person requesting the connection and only connect when they feel comfortable connecting. Okay, so usually a person's decision as to whether you want to be a, a lion or a closed networker. But when inviting connections, I'd really suggest to you that you branch out and don't just go with the standard, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn, but be more creative and be more personal. So you might want to state in that who you are, how you met and came across that person's profile, and why you'd like to connect. Okay, so a benefit of having a well-written LinkedIn profile is that you will increase your chances of being found in a search by recruiters, and you can effectively communicate information about your professional experiences. Make sure that you include key words for searches, both technical skills and behavioral competencies. Spend as much time on your LinkedIn profile as you would on your CV. A well-done done profile is similar to a well-done CV, but in terms of styles, profiles tend to be a lot more narrative and less focused on bullet points. Okay, consider how the LinkedIn search engine will find, or perhaps miss, your profile. So tricks to include can be your company names. Certainly include the umbrella company name if you work for a subsidiary. With technical skills, I would, for example, use Project Management Professional and PMP, or British Psychological Society and BPS. So use the abbreviation as well as the full name. And I'd also do that with school names, use abbreviations and the full name. 
so Open University as well as OU. If you'd like to find more about how to effectively use LinkedIn, please do listen on Tuesday the 29th of May at 6 o'clock to Jane Barrett's webinar on the subject, which she'll go into it in a lot more detail. All right, but let's go back to taking action for effective networking by looking specifically at networking events. Okay, so as and when you go to networking events, do set yourself a goal. For example, that you'll stay for at least 60 minutes and that you'll ensure that you speak with at least three people. Do your research. Find out who's going to be there in advance so that you can target people if you need to. This will also help to open up conversations for you. Turn up early, especially if you're an introvert. It's a lot easier to enter an emptyish room than one that's crowded and buzzing with people who look to be partying. Okay, dress appropriately and comfortably. My goodness me, I've been caught out far too many times in uncomfortable shoes and it's just not worth it. Have a name badge. You know, if you have one that's given to you, check the spelling and the title. If it's wrong, ask yourself how much does it matter. A minor spelling mistake can probably let it slide, but if it's a major mistake, then you want to rewrite it. Make sure that you turn up with your business cards and ensure that you have them close to hand and that you have a separate place for keeping the ones that are given to you. There's nothing worse than handing over a business card and realizing that it's somebody else's. So carry a pen with you as well. And just be aware of business card etiquette as well. So business card in etiquette in Asia is very different uh, to within the UK. It's symbolic. It's a gift of identity. So if a card is given to you with both hands and the card facing upwards, do take some time to read it and comment positively on the quality. Don't just shove it immediately into your pocket, but instead leave it on display for a moment or two. Now remember, at networking events, extroverts, you're going to dazzle with your light banter and your networking. Introverts, you're going to impress with your thoughtful follow-up. Okay, so what's in a name? It's often been said that the most beautiful word is your own name. And it's surprising just how often people say about others, you know what, he's a really good guy, or maybe it's just because he remembers my name. Remembering somebody's name can really make a good impression but first of all, you really have to care. So, if like I do, you struggle with name recollection, there are some tips on how you can remember names. So, firstly, use the name in conversation. Try and use it three times. Ask how to spell it and clarify the, the pronunciation. Okay, some various things that you can do there. But as a good networker, you can also help other people to remember your name for which I would greatly thank you. Um, so firstly, you can wear a name badge throughout the event. Secondly, repeat your name. If you have a well-known name, uh, you can ask whether somebody knows another person with that name, or you can recall somebody with a well-known name uh, that's the same as yours. For example, for me, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, but not Elizabeth Taylor. If you have a less recognized name, you can spell your name slowly, or you can offer a rhyme or a memory tool. So just last week, I met somebody called Ipe uh, with a spelling which I wasn't aware of, uh, and it didn't resemble the pronunciation. And beautifully, his first comment to me was to say, Ipe, just like Ipe. So needless to say, I've remembered it and him. So reintroduce yourself the first several times that you meet, and when somebody new joins the networking group, please do introduce yourself with your name. Okay, so once you've conquered that, the art of conversation. Firstly, do introduce yourself clearly and ask questions of your fellow networkers. But do make sure that you balance this out with providing information. Don't hide by just asking questions without being willing to give something else back. I'd like to suggest here the platinum rule as the best approach to taking conversation with networking. So I'm sure you're aware of the golden rule, which is treat others as they, sorry, as you wish to be treated yourself. The platinum rule, one step on from that, is treat others as they wish to be treated. So when you're at a networking event, make your attendance clear. Sandy Villas and Donna Fisher in their book called The Power of Networking have some great opening lines for conversation if you want some inspiration. Uh, but it's all about being upfront. 
in what you're looking to achieve in a positive and engaging way. Okay, and remember that the person that you're speaking to at any one time could be the key to your success. Vice versa, you could be the key to success to somebody else. So don't view networking as a one-way process. Let's remember Carol Stone and Stephen D'Souza at the beginning with their quotes. Networking is about mutual benefit. Okay, so I'd now like to draw our attention to follow-up. So I've talked during the course of this webinar about follow-up, and this is where a lot of people really fall down in networking. The first tip I have is to make reference comments on the back of cards, okay, uh, particularly if you've committed to something, but just be aware that they must be factual and not subjective. Your business cards could put their way into somebody else's hands, so you don't want to be in an embarrassing position. Okay. As soon as you've come away from a networking event, update your contact list as soon as possible. If you've been attended an event, thank your host via email or letter and try to do this the following day. And contact any new connections within 48 hours whilst the memory is still vivid. Attaching an article about a conversational topic that you've spoken about could be a useful way to add to that positive impression or sending a link to a website that you've mentioned. And most importantly of all, please do follow through on any commitments which you have made. Okay, I just wanted to flag that we're coming to the close of this part of the webinar, and very shortly I'll be taking questions. So please do start to formulate any which you have for me to address. There are some useful sources of information and some books which I've referred to on this webinar in this slides that I've presented here. There are also a couple which I haven't mentioned to date, but which I think might be interesting for some of you. So Horse's Mouth, uh, sorry, Horse's Mouth is an men e-mentoring site which allows you to search for or to become a mentor. And mentoring is a great way to start networking. So that could be something that you could look at. There's also businesscircuit.co.uk which is a site for entrepreneurs to help you network with like-minded people and investors if you're thinking of setting up on your own. Okay, I've mentioned this before, uh, but I just wanted to remind you about the webinar that Jane Barrett is facilitating on the 29th of May. Uh, Jane will give a far more thorough introduction to LinkedIn than I've done today, and we'll talk really about how it works. Importantly, she will focus on how recruiters work with LinkedIn and how you can use that knowledge to your advantage, looking at finding new jobs and new projects. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to you now for any questions that you may have. Okay, we've got nothing at the moment. Oh, here we go. I was about to say we've got nothing at the moment, but we have now. Yeah. Um, Johanna has actually sent a question through saying, what would you advise to have on the business card when currently... She's, if she's not actually working at that particular point. So what, what details would you put on a business card if you don't actually have a job? Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for that question. A very useful question. So if you're currently studying, I would look at potentially having one that's a reflection of business school. So certainly as a recruiter, I often go to business schools and people very freely hand over their cards which have got their business school uh, titles on them. So that can be one approach that you can take that. Um, I'm also very used to getting business cards which literally have to have the name of the individual, um, the email address, the telephone number, because ultimately the business card is something that somebody can take away and have for reference purposes, either to put into their Rolodex or to put straight into their contact list. And that's what you want to be putting on there. So if you are not studying at the moment, if you're not employed at the moment, then I would put your name, I would put your telephone number and your email address, just for somebody to take away. Okay, I hope that helps. Okay, um, any more questions from anybody? Okay, Sarah Bailey's um, just asked if you put the slide back up with the references on again, so I think that was the previous oh, slide. Very good. <laughs> Let me do that one. There you go. Brilliant, that's lovely. Thank you. Anybody else have any more questions if you want to send those through? 
Uh, do you know how actually said, I have one tip, I got one, to write a date on the business card, which is quite a useful one, isn't it? Particularly Fantastic. if you've been at an event, what event you've been at. Thank you very much. And, uh, and some good networking going on there. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing information. Very <laughs> helpful. Um, nothing at the moment. We are here till 7 o'clock, everybody. So, obviously, please do utilize the time um, and send through any questions that Lizzie can answer for you. Um, it's a great opportunity whilst we've got her here um, for you to actually take advantage. So, please do keep sending those through. You're being very quiet and shy mm. tonight. <laughs> If anyone would like to share how they got to Brad Pitt, I'm sure we'd all be delighted. Oh, yes, that'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd all be interested in that. <laughs> or maybe they're all keeping Brad Pitt to themselves. <laughs> I'm very happy to stay on the line until 7 o'clock, um, so I will do so, but I'm conscious that we've got some, some quiet here. Oh, hang on a minute. Oh, we have a Mark Duckworth um, sent a question through, just asking how long do you have to network to realise the benefits of networking? Oh, <laughs> very good question. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> how long indeed. Mm. Um, I would, I would say, how long's a piece of string to a certain degree with this one, Mark? So I do apologise for being so vague with my answer. Um, but I think if you become very concerted with your networking as part of your job search, then I would look to say three to six months. But I think networking does take time because whilst you're very enthusiastic at a certain point, other people don't have that same um, enthusiasm as you for, for whatever the purpose is. So just be aware that if you contact a number of people wanting to follow up, have coffee with them, have a chat about something, um, then ultimately people are away, people don't have time. So I would say that from my experience, about 70% of people follow up and sort of ag agree to do something. I fully expect that around 30% of people probably won't. And then within that, just trying to catch diaries. But I guess just for a bit of proof in the pudding. Um, I've been working for the past 15 years and I've had four different permanent jobs during the course of that time and all number of different contracts. Um, and the first job that I ever had was the only job that was advertised. Um, all other jobs that I've got have been through networking and through, through getting to know people. So I don't think I can really put a time frame on it. But if you've got a very concerted project plan um, for networking and for getting a job, I'd look to say be realistic in three to six months. Okay, we've got some more coming through okay. now. Um, Cameron's asked, um, obviously you've talked about um, referencing to starting conversations while networking. He's just wondering if you had any recommended ways of actually closing a conversation <laughs> and being sort of effortless being able to move on to another group or an individual. So how would you finish a conversation with somebody? Oh, gosh, absolutely, yes. There can be a tendency to be stuck with one person or one group <laughs> for the whole evening if you're not careful. Um, one way that I could do that would certainly be to excuse yourself to, to go and perhaps offer somebody a drink and say, I'm just going to go and get a drink. Can I get you one en route? And then start talking to people. Make sure you do take them a drink back if they've said yes, but that can be one technique to do so. Or you could say, ah, oh, there's somebody I specifically want to meet and I see them over there. Will you excuse me while I go and introduce myself to them? Um, so I think being quite clear in the fact that you want to move away from the situation um, you could take somebody with you and say, ah, um, there's a group of people over there who I'd like you to come and meet. You can then introduce somebody uh, and then start to engage them in conversations and then you can move away a little bit more successfully. Because whilst you don't want to be stuck with somebody all evening, at the same point, you don't want to leave somebody all evening. So please do, do bring them into other group conversations 
and that will allow you to move on a little bit more, more easily. Um, but some, some good reasons would be, as I say, go and get something to drink, recognize somebody and suggest that you want to go and speak to somebody and just be explicit. You know, I've given myself 45 minutes here because I've got to dash off and I really have set myself the goal of speaking to three people. So if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to move on. Something like that. So a couple yeah. of ideas there, Cameron. That's good advice. Um, moving on, we've got a question from Anna Maria. Um, this is quite an interesting one. I think networking works differently in different cultures. Mm -hmm. What works in one place doesn't work in another. She wondered if you knew of any books on this particular subject that might be helpful about how you could network in, in different cultures. Oh, goodness, Anna Maria, that's a very interesting question. And I'm <laughs> honest that none spring to mind. The books that I've quoted and that I've certainly read in my past have not differentiated between cultures. Um, but let me give that some thought. Let me spread that out in case uh, our network <laughs> that we've got on the line knows of any. Yes, that's a good point. If anybody knows, obviously anybody who's still on the um, webinar, if you do know of any useful networking books on that particular subject, if you want to send those through to me, um, to the question and answer panel, that would be really useful and obviously we can let Anna Marie know. Um, while you're doing that, if we just move on to the next one, I've got Sheet asked the question, I find it hard to network where there's an established network and they talk a small talk, mm -hmm. i.e. about football, and, and he's just wondering if there are any good ideas on how to sort of join an established network and actually get in there. Okay, so I gosh, that's a very tricky one when you've got established networks and they start talking as you describe about mm. football or whatever it happens to be. Um, I think one of the first things to do is think to yourself, well, what do you want to get out of, of that particular established network? What is your purpose for interacting with that group in the first instance to do so? Um, because I think sometimes you can just find yourself just immersing yourself in small talk and having to follow on that sort of football conversation or whatever it happens to be without any purpose, and I think that's a real challenge where a lot of people struggle to do so. Um, and my advice to you on that one would be actually just to be a little bit more clear about what you're looking for. So if you are entering a group that are, are talking quite, uh, quite a little bit about small talk, is to bring the conversation around to something like just asking, so other than talking about football, uh, you know, what, what purpose does everybody have to be here? And putting it out there so that you've got an opportunity then to talk, to talk about why you want to be there uh, and your purpose as well. Because I think often when people know each other and they're attending in some way a networking event, conversation can just slip back into whatever is a comfortable zone for them. But the reality is that if people are attending a networking event, the chances are that they don't just want to talk about football either. So they'd probably be quite grateful to somebody coming in and being prepared to challenge them a little bit. So I think that would be my advice, to have your clear goal and in a conversation like that be prepared to, to take a step and actually invite people to talk about why they're there. Uh, but a tricky one. A tricky mm. one. Okay, Ted Lay is actually... Um, sent in a question. Um, he's recently moved to a part of the southeast where there's quite a lot of IT industry employment and he's wondering if you can recommend any particular networking opportunities that would help him find work in the IT industry in the southeast. Um, and he's got a PS just saying he's not deep IT specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you. just wondering if you actually could give any advice and you may or may not know, I don't know. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, at this point in time, I have to be absolutely honest and put my hand up and say that IT is not my area of specialism and, and I'm not aware of networks. However, I have no doubt that there are, are plenty out there. So my first bit of advice would actually go to, to look at LinkedIn and I would start doing some searches there for particular forums within uh, LinkedIn around IT and you can put some geographical areas within that. So that would be my first tip that I would take there. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other areas. I'll quickly just butt in, actually, because mm -hmm. Francis Campbell has just sent um, something through about there's an IT network called Digital Surrey. Um, so I don't know if that helps you, Ted, at all. Um, so it's called Digital Surrey. Fantastic. 
this is working very effectively for your network. I think they're all much. doing very well. I've got just <laughs> another one from Robert Griggs just before we move on to the next question, just really relating to Anna Maria's. Um, saying that the FT have a guide on business networking by Heather Townsend, which has a chapter on networking across cultural barriers. Um, so you may want to, to look at that, Anna-Marie, um, just with reference to how you can network across different cultures. So that's very useful. Thanks, Robert, for that one. Um, we've got a question from Patrick Finch, um, which this is quite a good one, actually. Um, if you're already in employment, how can you effectively network without alerting your employer that you're looking to move on? Um, he's just saying that his director is quite a, a, a big networker and is connected to him on LinkedIn and Google Plus and Facebook, etc. <laughs> so that's quite hard. Um, so it's quite a difficult one, that, isn't it, if you're actually working? Absolutely. So, Patrick, I think maybe uh, you need to perhaps start looking out so side of the social media and if you've got time to start thinking about other types of networking that you can do outside so for example um, you might want to look oddly at a sort of a different type of club let me put it this way so a sports club a private members club um, different types of environments where you can meet people uh, who are likely to have some similar uh, thinking to you or some similar interests to you just to move you out of the space that you know that your that your boss currently operates in, uh, let's put it that way, because I completely understand uh, that when sort of particularly with small industries where there are a lot of people know each other, that can be quite a difficult thing to do. So the first thing I do is start to look a little bit creatively outside of those areas and start having some more uh, face-to-face networking type of opportunities um, to take it out of the, the digital space in that respect. So that could be one approach that you can take within that, um, and I'd encourage you to do so. Of course, you've always got industry conferences that you could go to, um, and you can always have quiet conversations with individuals. But if you know that your your boss is quite a networker, obviously you just need to be aware of the types of conversations that you have, and that's sort of the confidentiality element of it uh, on the basis of uh, who your boss is likely to know and how they might use that information. So I would branch out a little bit, would be my advice there. Okay, you'll be very impressed here. We've got Georges de la Calais, who is actually taking the ball by the horns, and would just like to say hello to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and after knowing what a line is on LinkedIn, he'd like to connect with as many people as possible. Um, and he'd just like everybody to know that his LinkedIn name is Georges de la Calais, which is J O R G E. Uh-huh. D E La of the L A and then Calais C A W L E and his company is Gorvatech, which is based in Madrid, which is G O R I'm sorry, G O B E R T E C. He runs his own IT company. Um and if anybody'd be interested in connecting with him, he'd be very interested. Fantastic. So that's very good. <laughs> very um, much indeed. We've got a couple of minutes left if anybody else wants to send um another question or two through. Just while we're waiting, um, a recording of the webinar will be available on the WorkMaze website, um, which you can actually access through www.workmaze.com. Um, and you'll see there's a business school section, and you can actually go in there and log in um, using the Open University login details, where the login is O-U-B-S, and the password is SBUO, I'll get that the right way around. Um, and you can actually view some of the previous webinars that we've all done as well. Um, so you will be able to, to go and have a look at a recording of the webinar which shows all the slides, etc. again. So if you have missed anything or want to just go back um, and look at a section again, then you will be able to access from there. Um, Alison, you've just asked whether it would be good to see other participants' names who was involved. Yes, it would, but unfortunately we're not allowed to actually show um, the participants due to data protection. Um, obviously, the Open University are happy to do that. We can do that in the future. We haven't done it from this point of view just because of that case. Um, Sarah Bailey's just um, sent one through saying, thank you very much. Um, this is for you, Lizzie, really. Um, it was very useful um, and very professional, and I should just say thanks for making it available for them. 
Thank you very much, Mr. C. Back to you. Um, so, if nobody's got any more questions, uh, oh, hang on a second. We've got one coming from Francis Campbell here, actually. Is what is the best way to introduce yourself at a networking event if you're unemployed? Okay, so that's a very fair question indeed, and I think uh, um, many of us, I speak for myself here, have certainly been at situations, and that can be quite uncomfortable if you if you don't manage it uh, in that respect. What I would do to introduce yourself is really talk about uh, some of the experiences that you that you've had. So my experience is in the whatever industry, and I'm currently looking at opportunities within that field particularly. Um, so be very positive about it rather than I'm not currently doing anything. Um, but focus on what, your, what you, your skills are and where you're looking to, to move into, I think is a, a very positive approach to take. I would also potentially, if you're doing any voluntary work, if you're doing um, anything that people could, could sort of latch onto as some conversational topic about the skills that you've got, I would also mention that as well. So oh, this is who I am, this is my experience, and at the moment I'm looking at opportunities in different areas. Keep it positive. Okay. Great. I think that's it, um, guys. Thank you very much to everybody who's attended. Um, and obviously, at the end, if you can please complete out the feedback, it's really useful um, just to find out how um, useful you found the webinar. So if you could do that, that would be great. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank Lizzie. That was a great webinar. Um, I'll just hand you over to Lizzie just so that she can say goodbye. Um, but once again, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at the next LinkedIn one. So thank you everybody for attending. I really appreciate it and it's great to get some, some super questions towards the end. But more importantly, it's really great to see that you're helping out with some networking there. So that's been wonderful and I hope it's useful for you. And good luck with your networking. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.